Hi guys. We are going to give some of our behind the scenes from my extreme triathlon in Lavinio, Italy called the Icon Race. I have already written my race report, which I found it incredibly difficult to capture the race in just words um, and in the amount of words that I think would be most people would find readable um, <laughs> on a blog. So I hope that this additional information will help you, whether you're just interested in the race or you want to know more about my experience or you might be interested in doing it yourself. Um, first of all, the preparation. And Carl uh, was talking with our friend Honza, who also helped us out. And you guys were talking about kind of how this just becomes like the next step. Yeah, it's like that you have to grow into it. You know, it's like the evolution of like, you are, so you are a triathlete and you've done some local distance, uh, I mean, lo local races, you know, spring, Olympic distance, you know, you might have done a half, then you then you kind of evolve and you do some of the bigger national level, international races, you know, such as, you know, Ironman brand, Challenge brand, you know, and, and, and some of those. And then, uh, you know, you've done it for several years and you have experiences and you just kind of seek what's the next thing or what's the next challenge that uh, uh, will challenge you because you know at some point uh, during the Ironman races it just kind of becomes routine because you've done it so many you've done it you know 20 times you kind of know what to expect regardless of the course regardless of the condition you kind of you've been there you've done it you can reach into the back of experiences and and find a solution to any given moment of the race mm -hmm. but this was something new something different and that's what we talked about it uh, it's kind of like you you have to grow into it you cannot just like jump in it and say oh this is my first try although there were two people right mm -hmm. two people that this was their first triathlon not like the first extreme or long distance <laughs> first triathlon yeah i wouldn't recommend that yeah. um so yes this was years in the making a decade plus in the making i started my first uh, Ironman was in 2006. I was 24 years old. I've done 19 Ironmans up until I did Ironman Canada. So this was my 21st full distance triathlon counting the extreme try that I did uh, a few, two months before this. So this was a long time in the making. And with that comes a lot of resiliency, a lot of strength, a lot of understanding of what works for my body, what doesn't work for my body, um, understanding nutrition as a board certified sports dietitian. I understand the fueling needs, but at the same time, this is very different um, because I'm not racing for 10 and a half hours. I'm racing for 15 to 16 hours at a similar intensity. So just think about you the reader or the listener, you know, think about you doing a half or a full and then add on that same effort several more hours. You know, the demands become very different. Um, the I staying healthy is definitely something that's a priority. So you can't just add more mileage. You have to really know what works for your body so that you can meet the demands of this type of event. Uh, I haven't had any injuries since 2019. Um, I've been healthy since um, August of 2019. So that's many years of very consistent training without breaks um, so or forced breaks. So that has also allowed me to build a lot of really good fitness. And like Corral mentioned, that this was kind of the evolution, the next thing that excited me, that scared me, that tested me. And I have to be honest, through the entire year, I was scared. Every single time that I trained, especially swimming, I could not get out of my mind that I would be swimming in very cold water in the dark. It was on my mind. It helped me get all my workouts in. I consider myself a very motivated person, but sure, we have those days where it's like, yeah, you know, maybe I'll cut this a little bit short. No, I did all the workouts I prescribed for myself. Um, I knew what I needed and that scary goal or that scary race of icon, it made me want to do the work because I wanted to be prepared and I was scared of this, the magnitude of this event. And I would just add to it, uh, like how it uh, kind of happened that, if we pick 
the, the extreme triathlon as a, like a type of the races for you. It was kind of like when we were just kind of chatting and, uh, you know, uh, about what's the next thing. And, you know, I expressed my interest into, I really like more of the old off-road stuff and gravel races. And, and you said, but I still love the triathlon. I still love the, you know, the swim bike run, but what. And I still like the distance. Yeah. And, and the distance and I'm, I'm good at it, but. So what we, what can we do? What type of events we can find that you can still do that, but it will be a lot more challenging. And that's kind of what yeah. We and also, up. for some reason, road running is is still very challenging for me to be competitive relative to my swim and my bike. So I wanted something where I felt like I could use my strengths, um, but not get injured. And I just haven't found that right recipe for the Ironman run to see it significant improvements like i'm still seeing at 41 years old in my swim and my bike i'm still improving but i wanted to feel that same competitiveness on the run but without a risk of injury leading up to this um there's a lot of different methods that i feel helped me but you know with the magnitude of the race and knowing that i'm biking for 123 miles over 15,000 feet of elevation uh, five mountain passes and um, uh, nine plus hours of biking um, that is hard to kind of train for. <laughs> like I'm not going to just go out and do nine hour rides every single weekend. Yeah, yeah. but not not just those years of experience and all the Ironmans, you know, everything. I often tell athletes this, like you don't just go to a race and you're just thinking about the long workouts you did in the eight weeks before the race. You're thinking about all the workouts and races you did in the years leading up to that race. You know, your body remembers all of that. So knowing that I, I, Corral and I, we really wanted to do a lot of different events this year. We do really enjoy the off-road racing and off-road riding, and that allows us to get a different type of training stress. So I did a lot of mountain biking, a lot of road biking, a lot of gravel riding. I didn't ride my tri-bike very much, although in Canada, man, I did ride the tri-bike, but in this race was the road bike. I do have a tri-bike on the trainer, and I do ride the trainer once a week throughout almost all of the winter, but it's very high intensity work. Um, and it's no more than maybe 60 minutes, 75 minutes. Sometimes I was only on there for 45 minutes, but it's very specific and very hard, which taps into energy systems that are not my strength. I'm more of a diesel. I can go for long hours, but it's very important to tap into that threshold, the higher intensity to raise that threshold. And also in any time you're doing hilly races, your power is constantly going up. Anytime you get out of the saddle, you have to do a steep climb. So you need to be able to produce those watts and be able to uh, tolerate that higher heart rate for short periods of time. So higher intensity work is very important. Uh, also, I do a lot of group rides. Um, but with all of this comes a very different type of training stress. Um, it a lot of intensity, a lot of surges, a lot of high heart rate, high power, a lot of cadence changes. So you would think, okay, you're training for this long distance race where you're riding for nine hours. Um, then you have to run a marathon. You should be focusing on steady efforts or aerobic or, you know, fat burning workouts because you're doing this for a long period of time. But I actually feel that it's, we need a similar, a similar approach with endurance, but you almost need an opposite approach that you need to tap into that high intensity because you are using all different types of energy systems when you do these extreme events because of the elevation changes. Yeah. It's kind of like a mix and blend of, uh, you know, both worlds. You still, you know, do the endurance rides, but like you said, uh, there's no need to do nine hour bike ride. You know, you, you tap your and you did, you know several rides that will be you know five hours uh, you know plus minus an mm -hmm. hour so four five six but then we did uh, those long uh, endurance events yep, that, uh, we'll get to that that would uh, cover the, a lot longer time and and and, and work the strength so and what you said with the you know with uh, doing this high uh, top and efforts you know and, and a mix of all the uh, efforts to 
to access all the other energy system it's so important because you know if you're just going steady and 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 work that uh, diesel like you said it's uh you know you're limiting yourself to like that one type of the energy system and and eventually you just kind of get stale at it so mm -hmm. you need to you need to spice it up yeah Going into the icon, I did eight events this year that were over five hours. Um, the events that I did this year, Xterra South Africa, which was three and a half hours, a six hour mountain bike race, which was six hours, um, the a whole enchilada mountain bike race, which was five and a half hours, a Saluda gravel race, which was six hours, um, a, another gravel race, six gap gravel, which was seven and a half hours, um, the Whitewater Triathlon, which was an off-road try, two hours and 45 minutes. Oak Mountain, which was an Xterra race, three and a half hours. I did Virginia Blue Ridge 70.3, which was five hours. I did the Belgian Waffle Ride the week later, which was 132 miles, 10 and a half hours. And then we did the High Cascades 100-mile mountain bike race, which was nine hours and 46 minutes. And then I did Canada Man, um, which was... Um, uh, about 15 hours that's a lot of events and a lot of racing for you it's a right? lot of events a lot of racing and a few interesting things so first of all every time that i raced i put myself into the same mindset that i would need for the icon in terms of what am i eating the day before what am i eating the morning of what's my routine dealing with the nerves uh it, for the majority of the races this year were in rainy or cool conditions which I do not like, but work well for Icon. So it really gave me the opportunity to practice in different gear, clothing, thinking about all those different things that's gonna be similar to Icon. Um, also, I'm out there for long periods of time. So you're, you're going through different emotions and highs and lows, and you have to think about your equipment and pacing. Um, so these races were actually used as training but I got so much more out of it that you can't just get in training by itself. You know, when you think about doing a long workout, it's so easy to cut it short. It's so easy to modify the course, you know, depending on the weather or how you're feeling. Um, you might not take your nutrition as seriously because you're not in a competitive environment. Uh, so doing these races really helped me. And I was always thinking about the same things that I would be going through, even though it wasn't the same scenario with swim, bike, run, but being out there for 10 and a half hours at the Belgian waffle ride gravel race, you know, I'm out there all day it really helped me. And I used my prior Ironman experience as well. So I got a lot of fitness from all of these events. And the other thing is that I didn't take any breaks after these events. So I was training right into them. I was training right out of them. There was an event here or there that I was just really smashed because I wasn't really tapering going into these events. So maybe I would just do an easy spin the next day. I think maybe there was one or two that I had the day off. I took the day off, whether it was travel or just so exhausted. Um, but other than that, I would do the event easy day, the day after get right back into training. So that was also a little bit different with versus doing, um, a race is, or, or in doing these races, I took the nutrition, the pacing, everything a lot more seriously. And I think sometimes when we do our training, when we don't take it as seriously, sometimes our recovery is not so good. Mm -hmm. So knowing that I need to nail everything to perform, that also helped me recover a lot quicker. So, yeah, so basically there was a lot of uh, uh, accumulation of uh, training, fatigue, you know, dealing with that fatigue. And try to recover while you are still training you know? yeah. so there was a lot of these uh, pieces to the puzzle that everything was kind of leading towards the icon and even that the canada man it was still a piece of the puzzle that uh, you know was on the way to the icon as the icon was the big daddy of uh, of uh, all the all the races that you have planned and the main event that you focus on right yeah and uh, one thing that you forgot to mention is that you know it was not just a, a you know the training element and the and the and the fatigue that uh, you know that you did through these races that help you but also you were working on the on the mental toughness mm -hmm. because some of these events were not just smooth sailing there were some obstacles that you have to deal with yep. right and so if i just kind of like go in my mind uh, back and and think about an early early season so uh 
if I remember correctly, uh, in the whole enchilada, you got up the course, you have to find your way back to the course, you completed more than what the course actually was, mm -hmm. right? So that was uh, it was the challenge that you had to overcome, and 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 you know you did that. You didn't just freak out. You didn't call it a day. You know you still did it. Uh, in the uh, Saluda uh, uh, gravel race, you know the you know the, the signs were taken off and the Garmin malfunction, and you ended up uh, with longer ride and got off the course again. And and again, it was uh, it was you know some emotional part involved in this. You know so again uh, help you prepare for tough moments in, in icon and and I told you after the race like because you were of course down on yourself and like I'm just not good at it I should not be doing it I said well think about a bigger picture right all these long endurance strength based events because it's off-road riding it's very strength based you know you can you ride on the road you get tired you can slow down and no big deal mm -hmm. you ride off-road you get tired you still need to produce that power that high torque to get over the obstacles and and over you know all what, what's in front of you in that in that loose turn. If you are in the loose gravel, you need to put more power to stay on the bike and not fall. You know, if you are on the mountain bike, you have to produce that extra torque to get over these roots and rocks and obstacles and whatever feature is there. So that really worked uh, mm -hmm. in in terms of preparation for uh, for the icon getting the strength work done. Mm -hmm. So. Again, mentally, you have to deal with these things. Yeah, right? Belgian waffle ride, I got a flat tire. Yep, and you have to deal with that. Uh, yeah. Virginia Blue Ridge, I got a penalty. Yeah. <laughs> I have not had the easiest year so far, but I think it all teaches you something. Um, on average, I trained about 15 hours a week, plus when you factor in some of these races, you know, taking down the training just a little bit, adding in the race, it might be 18, 20, but I really didn't do more than 20 hours throughout my training period. Um, there was a lot of frequency. Um, I swim four times a week regularly here or there, maybe three times depending on event or travel, but I... I do believe in being very swim fit, um, even for myself coming from a swimming background. So usually I swim between five, 15 and 18,000 yards a week. So four swims, usually somewhere between um, uh, 3,500 and 5,000, just depending on the type of set that I'm doing. Um, I don't need to do a lot of technique work all the time. So most of my work is a lot of higher intensity um, or in endurance work. Um, and then in going into Canada, man, um, my longest workout was five hours and 19 on the bike plus an hour run. It was really important to me to do these bigger bricks, um, just to test nutrition and this, to really work on some of those, uh, form strength, running tired off the bike for a longer period of time. And then I did a trail run of, uh, run hike of three hours and 25 minutes. I would never do any runs over two hours to 15 training for an Ironman, but with the incorporation of hiking, trail running, and also knowing that in these extreme tries, I am moving for almost five plus hours. I need to have more time on my feet. And one thing that we did do this year is I've really worked on getting my running weekly running mileage up to about 30 miles a week consistently, um, you know, mile or two here or there, give or take. But that comes from usually two or three days in a row of running or four to five times a week running. Some workouts might be just 15 minutes, um, sometimes running off the bike just for 10 minutes, but it all adds up. So I try to do more frequency running as well as getting up the long runs with the hiking a little bit more. But that also took, I would say, many months, if not years, to get to that point where my body could tolerate that higher running volume. And then eventually going into Icon, we did have two weeks where I ran um, over 40 miles uh, throughout that week, which it was important that we step it up a little bit more. But it wasn't just something like, oh, you should be running 40 miles per week. Let's just throw it in. It was a very slow, gradual progression. And a lot of my runs are hills um, and they or they have specific intervals. Um, so those weekly mileage, it, it's all very specific. Yeah, and also um, there were some break runs where, you know, you finish your... Uh longer bike and then uh, you know 
he kind of felt tired, but uh, he still wanted to do a brick run. So he just said, okay, let's uh, let's just go. And, you know, we have this uh, church here, right? Mm -hmm. So let's just go to the church and back, you know, which is like, uh, you know, anywhere from 25 to 30 minutes mm -hmm. run, right? And uh, you just fill it out. And then, you know, you went for a brick run and then you didn't come back until like an <laughs> hour later. And then it's like, so what happened? Well, you know, I felt good and uh, I just kept on running. And, uh, you know, then I did some hill work and, mm -hmm. you know, so you did some of these kind of uh, freedom brick rides where brick runs where you knew that you probably should be doing more but let's just start with this and see how the body responds mm -hmm. see how you feel you know and then you know you have some other athletes on the other end of spectrum where you know you have prescribed 20 minutes and they do 10 minutes because they just didn't feel it yeah yeah um, also some of, so the running in the extreme tries is very strength based because there's so much elevation. So one thing that I've been doing a lot this year is run strength run. Mm -hmm. Uh, Furman university is about two miles driving from us or about three to four miles worth of running, uh, depending on how we run there. Uh, that's also where we swim sometimes, but they have a great weight room. And we also use uh, EC Fit, which we can pull it up on our phone, or we've just got a lot of her moves memorized because we've done it for so many years. So I would run four miles or 30 minutes or so, run to Furman just nice and easy, do a 30 minute heavy lifting, mm -hmm. you know, start off with some mobility, some glute work, get things firing. And then I would usually do some uh, deadlifts or some squats with the bar or hex bar, some really heavy lifting. Um, and then I would run back home and I would have good nutrition throughout. I would still drink a sports drink, even when I'm lifting, um, have good nutrition there back. Um, but this ended up being like an hour and a half session with, you know, those two runs, but a lot of strength, a lot of load. Mm -hmm. And one of the runs that Corel actually encouraged me to do is to do uh, up to an hour and a half of running and then do the heavy lifting and then run home. That was a very challenging workout because I was already tired. I did have to adjust the weights a little bit just to not injure myself um, or to put too much stress, but still the concept was the same of let's load the body through running do the heavy lifting and then try to run home. And it's just really, you know, if anything, it's more mental than anything, just knowing like, oh my gosh, I, I still have to run. I still have to lift. Um, so it, it just really helps to make a strong, durable body. Yeah. And without it being silly training, you know, we don't want junk miles. I want these runs to be very, or these workouts to be very specific to the demands of the race. So on the bike, I'm doing a lot of climbing. I'm doing a lot of big gear work. Um, I love to, my style of riding is to get out of the saddle, but I need to learn how to produce more power at slower cadences when there's a steeper grade. And so I did a lot of seated climbing at very steep um, inclines when I would much rather be out of the saddle. So a lot of torque. Uh, so yeah, there was a lot of different specific work that I did going into this race. The only thing that I didn't do at anything uh, or any of is cold water swimming. And that is a fear of mine. Um, it, it's not comfortable for me. Uh, that's why I'm doing these events is to just find my limits. Um, but I do know that I need to do more. I did swim in cooler temperatures a, a few times, but it is something especially to test my gear for race day. So that's something that going into Norseman, I will do. Yeah. You also didn't jump from the house to the water. Like you'll be doing in the Norseman. I like will practice pretty high. I, well, I've been thinking about practicing off of Todd's dock and jumping into the water to get used to that. I mean, the dock is like this much above the water. Well, we're going to start with that <laughs> to get to the roof of his <laughs> yeah. dock. Yeah. House. Um, so, Consistency with my training was very important frequency, but just to give a few stats of those longer workouts, five weeks out, I did a bike ride, six hours, 23 minutes. I did a lot of my rides with friends just because I, they're out training. I can do my own work. Um, so the way that I would do my specific sessions is I would always work the climbs. I would regroup with them after I finish a climb, I would do it by myself um, as hard as I wanted to turn around, come back, get them. And then I would always do the last maybe 60 minutes, 30, 60 or 90 minutes, depending on the ride by myself. I say, see you guys. And I'd always do it very strong um, to finish off 
good. So I had that social interaction um, for these long rides, but I also had a lot of personalized time with myself doing what I needed. I also wore my hydration pack when I rode because I was on my ro road bike and I didn't want to rely on them for when they're stopping. I wanted to really dial in my nutrition. So that ride was six hours, 23 minutes, 9,000 feet of climbing, 101 miles, did a 50 minute run off the bike. The next day I did a two hour run uh, that was mostly on the road. There's some intervals there. Four weeks out, I did a six hour ride, 8,200 feet. Um, it's not easy for, it's not hard for us to find elevation here. Uh, it was 102 miles. I did an hour run afterwards. That was also a 48 mile run week. I ran six times that week. And then I did a two hour and 13 minute run three weeks out. We were in Breckenridge. Um, that was for Corel to do Breck Epic. And that was a great opportunity for me to train at elevation and or at altitude. And I feel like it really helped me out in Lavinio because I didn't feel the 6,000 feet that we were staying at. I didn't feel the 9,000 feet that I climbed up to on the Stelvio or to finish the race. So that really helped. The only problem was that um, I just couldn't do any intensity work, but so it was a great time for a volume overload. Um, I did a two hour and 15 minute run on trails and then an, almost a two hour hike. So it was almost four hours. I also did a seven hour bike, 116 miles and a 43 minute run afterwards. But I also did two hour rides, four hour rides. I was just doing a lot of volume when I was there. Um, so yeah. uh, if I can just go back to what you said, that you did some training with friends, yes. but you focus on yourself and you do, did your specific work and yes. then you would regroup and ride with them. One thing you didn't mention is uh, that uh, what you also did that uh, when uh, you rode with a group and uh, they decide, okay, we'll do the stop here. And they went to a bakery and, uh, you know, they would have like a 20 minute social stop. You just kept on riding and, you know, you communicated where, where they will be continuing going so that you went the direction, then you turn around, come back, mm -hmm. regroup mm -hmm. and continue. And this is something that, uh, many of you guys can do and uh, you know uh, when you do your training with friends and maybe those friends are more on the like the, the happy social riding and you have a work to do you can still be doing it you can ride with them and you do your own intervals or they stop and they are you know at a gas station for 20 minutes you don't need to be there you can just keep on riding and then you you know you you backtrack to the, the the route that your friends will be taking you know and we we deal with this all the time and we look at a file it's like oh great so you did this right and then you realize that well there's like a three or four 20 to 30 minute stops that's such a waste of time and you're putting your body into under the stress of uh, you know switching to the recovery mode and you need to restart it again and it's just it's not that purposeful training so you can really you know focus on yourself while you are still socializing with the friends and doing it this way yeah yeah so now into the race, and I'm going to give a little bit from my perspective, but I also want Corel to give his perspective because I think it's really great to hear what he saw throughout the race. Um, so just a few stats. My swim was 57 minutes. It was a 1.8 mile swim. The air temperature was 32 degrees. The water temperature was 53 degrees. Uh, so they shortened the swim. It was incredibly cold. Um, my bike was 123 miles, over 15,000 feet of elevation. Uh, riding time, it was nine hours and 12 minutes with stops, which are part of these extreme tries because it's all self-supported. It was a little over nine and a half hours. And then the run was 25.5 miles, about 4,000 feet of climbing, and it took five hours and 36 minutes. Now, pre-race, um, with these extreme tries, there are a lot of logistics. Every race is different. So it requires a lot of research, studying, reading any previous blogs, looking at course maps. Everything is well marked and it's organized. Uh, at least I have found in Canada Man and Extreme and Icon. But um, you just... It's, it's not like an Ironman where you show up and you know the course is going to be marked. You know that there's going to be volunteers there. Um, so a lot of logistics with getting gear together, getting nutrition together, getting clothing together. Um, for this race, even though I used the, the Epic Weather app that told me the weather and it was going to be a perfect, a beautiful day um, compared to what we had, which was snow, rain leading up to it, um, 
that we still had extra clothing, a whole new extra kit um, for the bike. I had extra stuff for the run. And all of this is very organized in bags. And Corel has it with him in the car. So a lot of logistics going into it. Uh, Pre-race, it's the, I'm finding that there are a few things that are still very hard for me. And the early wake up and the early start is still, I'm finding it very stressful going into the race. Now, once I wake up and so far I've been good, you know, that feeling when you wake up and you're just so tired. Well, so far I haven't had that, but that's always my fear is waking up at two in the morning or three in the morning and just being exhausted or tired. So thankfully I've woken up and have, I tell Corel, Corel, I feel good. <laughs> it's usually the first thing I tell him I'm good. Um, but that's, that just is a worry of mine because I'm not used to it. Even with Ironman racing, you're waking up at four, four thirty, but you're starting the race at seven. But when you're starting a race at four thirty or five and it's in the dark, it's just a, such a different stressor for, for the system. Um, so that's been something that I'm still getting used to. Um, then with this race being cold, um, that also was an additional stressor, but I felt like I was mentally prepared for that. So I didn't let that get to me. Corral and I, before these extreme tries, I usually create some kind of itinerary uh, so that he kind of has an idea of maybe where we'll regroup, where we'll stop, where I might need him, um, uh, if there's any gear changes. So it's for me, I try to be as organized as I can so that Corral is prepared. I don't want I don't expect him to figure things out. If anything, it's on me that I didn't communicate something properly to him. Um, but at the same time, he also feels a responsibility that his job is also to take care of me so that if something doesn't go well, that he's prepared also. So it's a lot of teamwork and a lot of understanding without directly communicating um, we've done so many races and training together that you kind of know what the other person might need. Yeah. So, you know, like the itinerary would be, you know, we kind of like a look at a course and we talk and, you know, we, we probably need to do, you know, this many stops and you will need to consume this much and how we do it and, uh, and how we will distribute it. Also the, uh, what I learned from the Canada, uh, uh man that, uh, you know, uh, sometimes, you know, of course you need to be flexible, but also I will need to be a little bit more firm and you, and we communicate before the race that I will want you to take this and eat it and you will be not feeling it. Like you don't want to take it now, but it is what you plan to take. And unless you have a GI issues that prevents you from taking it, you should take it. Even if you feel like, no, I'm good. Right. Yeah. Because I that, would say that so many times you're like, you, you should take this banana. No, I'm good. Here, take it. And yeah. you shove it into my mouth. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So there so, was a lot of that. Yeah. And then on the on top of that, you know, like we, we know that, you know, we should stop here, 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 here. But also I in the car as a support, I'm flexible because I'm, you know, constantly kind of like my radar is going on scooping the road. Like, oh, this is the place to stop. It's a good one. Even if we know that we probably don't need to do anything. But we'll stop here because it's a good place. We'll give you that pick me up that mm -hmm. you can you can see us, you can see me. We can talk as you are riding, and you may say like I don't need any right. Okay, that's fine. You know, mm -hmm. this was just an extra bonus stop. But just like constantly, you know, monitoring, you know, what the course is like, what the surrounding is, what you may need. Like saying, oh, okay, this is uh, you know the wind is coming here. That that's you know the hill is coming up, or this may happen, and. It's just kind of like constantly being on the top of everything, you know, because mm -hmm. you can't be thinking in that moment, you just, you're getting more tired and your job is to just keep on going. And my job is to give you everything that you need or stuff that you may not even know that you need. Yeah. Yeah. So as an example, uh, transitions are very important in these races because you have a lot more stuff than uh, a normal Ironman. Now, when I did Canada Man, the bike wasn't felt very similar to me. Um, but in this race, I had uh, 
I had leg warmers. I had shoe covers over my shoes. You have to have a front and a rear light. I had the map loaded on my computer. I had a base layer on. I had bibs on. I had a jersey on. I had a jacket on. I had um, hot hands in my gloves. I had gloves. I had ear covers. Uh, so you there was my jacket. Yeah, I had your jacket. So <laughs> there was a lot of stuff, plus my helmet and shoes. Uh, my uh, a, a buff to put on. So I had a lot of stuff. And so I'm also going through that with Corel. So he knows the order because mm -hmm. I, there's a certain order that I, I don't want it to just be chaos that he dumps everything out. And then we're trying to pick through it. I had everything laid out. So it's, you're putting one thing on at a time. And also we talk about how and when I will set things on the bike. So we knew that, you know, when you will be about 20 minutes in the swim, 20, 30 minutes, I will go on and I will turn on your lights on the bike. I will turn on the computer, make sure the map is loaded. Activate it's, it's the a, hot hands. Activate the hot hands, you know, and, and all these things that, uh, you know, then we don't have to do when you are actually doing the yeah. transition. So yeah. you can focus on the important things that you need to do yeah. in the transition. Yeah. And then when, when you leave, then I have to pick everything up. <laughs> There's, the transition doesn't stay there. Yeah. You know, after the last person leaves, they just, you know, it's not there anymore. Yeah. So you have to pick everything up at every transition. Yeah. So. And then catch up to you. Yeah. Now, everybody knows that, or if you don't know, I got hypothermia from the swim. I was shaking uncontrollably. Uh, there was a chance that I wouldn't continue because it was uh, it, very hard to recover from that being so cold. Um, when I was swimming, my gloves filled up with water. My immediate, I couldn't swim because they were so heavy with water. My immediate reaction was take them off. I didn't want to litter. Uh, so I put them down my wetsuit because I put them down my wetsuit. It created more water that goes into the wetsuit. Then also I was stopping a lot because it's dark. It's very uncomfortable for me to swim in the dark and the cold. I wasn't swimming hard. The gloves weren't comfortable, so I had to adjust them. Then I was getting colder. I couldn't warm up. And then I was just getting, and there's only three buoys on the course, so I don't know how to pace myself. Um, it, it was just, uh, it was it was very hard, a very hard swim. Um, and I'm very thankful that I survived it and I was fit enough to that my body could get through it. But when I got to Corel, you know, his thinking is, okay, we'll just get Marnie dressed and she'll be on the bike. Um, so Corel, how was that transition? Yeah. So it was, uh, it was something that, uh, I did not expect because uh, in, in, in any other race, I'm never worried. I'm never worrying about you in the water, you know, because swimming is your strength and, you know, I see, you know, the first athlete get out of the water and then the next one. And then I just kind of like, and I saw the first female and it's like, where are you? And and I knew that the course was a little bit shorter, but you know, here comes the hour mark. And then you finally came out of the water. And then I saw the condition that you are in. in. And, you know, we originally planned that Honza will be at a, at the exit of the water. He will hand you a gel that you start consuming as you run into the transition. I will be there, you know, at the beginning to, to give you all the stuff so I could, drive go, me off. I, I could go with you into the tent, drive you off and do all that. But we have to basically change everything and, and stuff that we didn't expect that this would happen. Like this would, this would never cross my mind actually, you know? So we have to be really, really proactive and uh, you were just shaking, you could not move. So it was like trying to dress a shaking mannequin that doesn't cooperate with you. It was, it was really difficult. And, and by dress I mean like completely stripped down while keeping stuff on you to keep you warm, warming you up, dressing you up, you know, the good thing about, or the nice thing about this type of event is uh, everybody kind of looking uh, after each other, right? So there was a guy next to us and he offered me a warming gel, uh, warming oil to put on you. We did have actually, we planned on that. So we did have a cream, warming cream, but this sounded like it was much better and we can put a lot more everywhere, right? So I was just rubbing it all over you, that warming gel. Somebody else offered us a hot tea. So I, I, I made you to sip on it, you know, because again, you could not even think for yourself, right? And then the medical team was uh, standing up there and watching us very closely. So I would always like whisper in your ear, just try to fake it, try not to. And like, so I would stop focus, for a minute. Yeah, like focus <laughs> on breathing, you know, don't shake, you know, and it's like, and, and we were telling them and then Honza was there as well, that it's okay, that she will be fine. She just, you know, needs a little bit more time and they were watching you. I'm convinced that if it will be any like typical, uh, North American race, they would not let you continue. You yeah. know, and it just kind of was getting back to my mind how some athletes say, well, 
I, I ran and then I stopped sweating and the, the, you know, the medical, they look at me and they pull me off the course. Like, what does it really take to pull you off the course? Like, you can't tell me to stop if I don't want to stop, mm -hmm. right? I pay for this, right? This is, you know, I'm doing it. And like, if, if you believe you can continue, you can always continue. You know, so it's 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 different. It's something else if you are like losing consciousness. Yeah, and if just, your health you know, is, which yeah. in this case, my health was compromised. But but we wanted to take time. It wasn't yeah. like we were shoving me out on the yeah. bike while I'm still freezing cold. I actually was in there for almost 30 minutes, one of the last ones to leave. It never even crossed my mind to get on the bike. Our main priority was I need to be in this state of health to yeah. be well, able and, to continue. Yeah, and you and so like I don't know if I can do it. I'm like. Shh. <laughs> yeah. And it's just because me being a racer, having the racing mindset, I knew what you need. Yeah. And I knew that once you get on the bike, we at least need to try, mm -hmm. you know, then we can decide, but you will at least need to try to get you out on the bike and see what happens. Yeah. So after about 25, 28 minutes, I was not shaking anymore. I was so much. Well, you still were, but not a as little much. bit, but not as much. And it's like, hey, let's. Let's let's move on. We thought that maybe riding would actually warm me up because moving the muscles and actually I warmed up very quickly on the bike. So I had lots of layers on. I actually had to take off Corel's jacket. I took his jacket because I needed one more layer. Um, after like two miles, I was or three miles, I was warm. So I gave him the jacket back. I stopped. He put so it was also the, the warming oil was working. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you felt that you didn't realize. Yeah. That, and I think that. it also helped in a way that I wasn't over biking like a lot of other athletes because they were so cold. They were biking so hard to start in order to warm up now onto the bike. So the bike for men, several hours was in the thirties in the forties. And that can sound extreme for a lot of athletes, but actually have a lot of experience riding in cold weather. Uh, we do it year round here we do a lot of mountain biking and gravel biking which is a lot easier to ride in cold conditions when you're off-road um, i do a winter bike league in december and january which every saturday 10 o'clock no matter the conditions i show up and do do this ride with the group of 30 50 80 people um i i do ride my bike outside year round um for my longer sessions, uh, road bike. So I have a lot of experience, not just riding in colder conditions, but also dressing in colder conditions. So I kind of know the, the type of clothing, what, what, um, what styles to do like undershirt, jacket, arm warmers, knee warmers, vests, you know, vest, those things. So I kind of have an idea of what to wear. So that really helped me. I also did a lot of seven plus hour rides this year. So just the magnitude of that, I felt very prepared for. Also nutritionally, I practice a lot of different nutrition. Uh, I knew I needed to eat a lot more solid food, which I don't do in a full distance Ironman. Um, so and that, the seven plus hour rides were the events that we talked about yeah, earlier. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then the oat route to Alps, the five day stage race that we did last year was probably the best preparation because I was riding tired. I was riding at different elevations. It was a seven day stage race. Oh, it was seven days. That's right. Seven mm -hmm. days. Um, riding tired, learning these type of climbs, you know, we have a lot of climbs here in Greenville, but we don't have two hour climbs. And it took me two hours and 15 minutes to climb the Stelvio, 14 miles, 5,000 feet of climbing. So those type of climbs are very unique in Europe, in the Alps, the Dolomites, the Pyrenees. Uh, and so I had a lot of experience with that from the Oat route. I also kind of, I also learned the the road structure. You, you learn the other cars, the little villages, the different types of road conditions. Uh, and I think all of that is really important when you do an international event. So I have a lot of experience riding my bike in Europe. Uh, so that helped me as well. I understand the descends, the switchbacks, the cornering, um, the road furniture, the signs. So all of that is very helpful. So Corral, maybe you can just um, share your role throughout this bike ride well uh so like we mentioned our friend uh, an athlete honza was there with us so he was the driver and i was the brain behind the uh, <laughs> uh you know what was going on in the car so you know 
in the back of our car, everything was kind of like prepared in the uh, the best accessible manner. You know, what we will need for for what, like what part, clothing, what, what, what part of the uh, of the race course. And then you know, I would be uh, monitoring, like I said, uh, monitoring the terrain and the condition, picking up the spots where we can stop. You know, as we were going and, and driving next to you, roll down the window, ask. Uh, is there something else like besides what we already planned what you may need you know like, oh i need or, to pee yeah so we find a spot or where i need different gloves where you can go or you know get that ready so it was all basically uh on me to you know pick the spots where we can start where we can do all the uh, changes and exchanges and uh, find a good spot for the toilet break and and, and everything in between yeah and it the rules with... and find a spot where we can get Hansa and i can get a coffee and, uh, <laughs> yeah. and refreshments yes yeah. yeah and then you have you have a nine hour car ride so mm -hmm. you have to have food as well yeah. plus you imagine sitting in the car for nine hours and go for a marathon in the off-road uh, yeah. setting yeah so it's, it's a lot of work yeah. uh Per the rules of extra, you can't hand off anything when the car is moving. Uh, the car has to be stopped. Um, so th they they would have to find a place to stop. So if Corel was handing me something, I always had one bottle on my bike because we didn't want to have too much weight on my bike. So only one bottle, not two. Uh, even when he handed me a bottle of water or some Coke, it usually just had a few ounces in it. So I wasn't holding a heavy bottle. Uh, so that was very strategic. But if he was handing me something like a bite of a banana or a bar or something, because uh, my goal was to try to drink a bottle every 75 minutes um, of, of infinite fructose, uh, knowing it's colder, I don't need as much fluid. So I was trying to get that in about every 75, 80 minutes, but then also within every 45 minutes to get in some extra solid food. So that was kind of my strategy. So Corel kind of knew what I was trying to achieve. Um, so he would hand me things it on inclines because i'm going a lot slower i could also talk to him but then also when he would he would be strategic he would pass me at a time where i could actually also talk to him and also tell him okay this is what i need or this is what i i will want at the next stop so he was already prepared and also it's a uh, you know uh in this event you know you have the other athletes there and the other support crew so you kind of see uh similar or same people uh, same people throughout the day, you know, and it was kind of also fun for us to kind of see like, oh, you know, this group of athletes are coming, Marnie was way behind and now she's coming too. So she, you know, oh, she passed this person. Mm -hmm. and, you know, so it's just kind of like to see the progress of the race. And, mm -hmm. you know, of course you cheer for the other athletes and they all are appreciative. Uh, they're getting some extra cheers. So it was really, really exciting. And like, you really feel like you are equal part of the race. Like yeah. sure you're not racing there, but without, us, you would not be racing yeah. either. And with these races, I'm never thinking ahead because there's so much that you have to take care of in the moment. I've learned that from Ironman racing, but at the same time, there's always kind of that thinking ahead. But when you're doing an extreme try, you just have to take care of the moment and that's all you can control. I wasn't even thinking about the bike when I was swimming because I needed to manage the swim. And same thing with the bike. I'm not thinking about the run. I'm thinking about the climb that I'm on, the descend that I'm on. Uh, one thing that was different with this race is we put tri bars or aero bars on my road bike. And that actually required a, a modification with my bike fit mm -hmm. because when we put them on, I was not comfortable. Well, it's not like I would put the bars on and tell you go for a ride. Right. You know, the, it was part of the whole process. So right. we add on the, the aero bars, we adjusted the fit, you know, to what may work. Right. But you still didn't feel comfortable, so we have to readjust it again. We choose different. Uh, we put different saddle on that helps you be in the airbus. But again, we need it. Like it's not like when some athletes have just a road bike and they they want to do a road triathlon, so they add on the clip on aero bars and we adjust the fit like they are on the tri bike. Here we, st I still needed to you know keep in mind that the main part of this race is doing a lot of climbing. You know, which you will be in the road bike position. So we could not just jeopardize that. Uh, the strong uh, position for climbing on mm -hmm. the road bike. Mm -hmm. We wanted to add on the extra ability to change the position on the bike into the aero bars in some of those valleys between those climbs. So it was yeah. kind of like a art of finding, you know, the good medium, what will work, you know, 
and not jeopardize your climbing on yep. the road bike. Yeah. So that's what we did. And, you know, we did have to adjust it a few times until, you know, we, we agreed that, okay, this is good. Yep. Yep. We got it. Yeah. So now on the run. So uh, for... one more thing oh, uh, yeah. about this when uh, I just kind of I just remember. Uh, so before the race, they told us that uh, because the, the race was going started in Italy, then majority of it was in Switzerland and, and then uh, going back to Italy. Well, the thing is that uh, Switzerland is not part of the European Union. So technically you are crossing the borders to different country, which requires to have a passport. And, you know, you maybe, uh, you know, uh, get stopped and inspected by uh, the officials. So I, you know, before we were just, you know, we say, well, well, they told us that you need to have your passport ready, you know, athletes and the support crew. So of course we have our stuff in the car, but we decided that rather than have Marnie biking the whole day with her passport and stuff, that I would have it on me and then we would get basically together, you know, to the crossing the border point in case they would stop us. It didn't happen. They, you know, we could just go. They just the way do you, you can go. But it was the additional kind of part of this race. And just like you mentioned earlier that, you know, you have to obey all the traffic laws. So you can, uh, if you get a red light, you're stopping. You know, if you, and there are some of those uh, one way, uh, Tunnels. Only tunnels where you know you may get there just on time when the uh, light switches and you can be waiting here for three minutes and that's part of the race you know yep. it's tough luck so you know this was another unique situation with this course that we needed to be prepared for yeah when i got to the last climb i had about a little more than an hour left so that was the last opportunity i saw corel we wanted to make sure that corel and honza could get to t2 in time uh, so they could set everything up in case there was any delays. Uh, also, Corel to get himself ready for his part of running with me. So they went ahead. So I didn't see them at all. So that was probably like the probably the if you had to put stressful on it, just because I was kind of alone mm -hmm. for that last hour and a half. Nothing could have gone wrong because i would have all you have to do is just climb up for an hour and a half yeah but still <laughs> yeah, yeah it's still kind of like oh my gosh my support's not here the only thing that is different in ironman that you actually you were carrying a phone in case yes you know so we could communicate in case yeah phone and a gps tracker that wasn't really working yeah so then when we got to the run, so the run, um, I did a full change of clothes on the run. Um, Corel had everything. He does such a great job, lays everything out for me. Um, I needed to pee. So I had to do that after I changed because it was outside of the transition area. And this, there's no like changing tents. There's men, I mean, there's only 10 women in the whole race, but, um, so everybody's just changing and doing their own thing in, in these tents. It's no yeah. big deal. I mean, nobody, nobody's running, signing up for these races thinking like, ha ha, we'll see some boobies there. <laughs> you know? So yeah. it's just like, yeah. you don't care. You get stripped naked and you care about yourself because the other athletes care about themselves, you know, they are there to do the race. Nobody cares about these things. Yeah, yeah. So I did a full change. I had an option between a tank and a shirt. I decided to go with the shirt. Um, I also ended up putting on gloves later on in the race because my hands got cold. So there's just a lot of things to think about because the day is, is long and you're going through different weather and terrain. So um, Corel was, it was so great to run with Corel. Um, we learned so much from the Canada man, um, which most of that I was by myself running and Crow was alone in the car, kind of, um, piggybacking me going ahead and, um, Feeding you, uh, yeah, getting me nutrition. Um, but this race, uh, Crow was with me the whole time and Honza was responsible of, uh, getting my bike and taking everything from T2 and then going back down to the Lavinio. Um, so maybe you could share your thoughts on the run. Yeah. So like you said, we, we learn a lot from, from the Canada. So this time, you know, we decided it'd be good for you if I run the whole thing with you, but we also learned that, uh, you know, in Canada, you know, once you put your stuff on, it was really difficult to, to, to run when you were tired. Right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we knew that, you know, I'll be carrying, you know, pretty much anything and everything that you need. You only, uh, you know, you started carrying uh, with the one flask. I have the other flask uh, with me and I will always make sure that, you know, everything is topped off. So you finish that one flask. I have another one that's already filled and then I will be refilling everything else. But I also run, you know, we, 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 we have to ask before this race, like, am I allowed to run ahead of you? And is it okay if I run ahead to the aid station 
get what you need and then give it to you. And they said, yes, some other races, you are not like Norseman. I, I will not be able to be ahead of you. I have to stay behind you, you know, so it's not pacing and mm -hmm. it's just the support in some, in case something goes wrong, mm -hmm. but it's totally up to you. So here I was able to do that. So I would be running ahead and some of the technical part, which, uh, you know, the first, uh, you know, uh, I don't know how many miles I actually ran two days before the race, right. Or mm -hmm. the day I don't remember. And, uh, so I was kind of familiar. I, I knew exactly where we're going, how the, how it goes and what's, what's ahead of us, which was really good because it was, uh, you know, some parts were a little bit more technical, it was off-road and uh, it was, uh, going over the rocks, crossing a few little creeks. So I would always point it out to you, okay, go, go this way or, you know, manage your steps. Don't get your feet wet because you are tired. I don't want you to step in the first creek that we have to cross and then you'll be running in the wet shoes for the rest of the day. So these were the things. And I would also make you stop. Okay quick reset, you know, take a few breaths. Okay. You know, count to 10 and restart, or, you know, we will just decide, okay, now we will walk this part because it's steep, but once we get to a certain point, we'll start running again. So you didn't have to really think you just did what I told you to mm -hmm. do. And we also, you know, learn from Canada that, you know, it's so easy to just start walking and keep on walking, but not here. Yeah. Right. We, we decided that even if you run just for five steps, it's still faster. It's still better than just keep on walking. Yeah. You know, so I was in charge of uh, making the decisions for you. And I was also kind of feeling and hearing your breathing and feeling how you may feel and adjusting everything. So there was never a part that I would be like to be a pacer. It's really art and you have to sync with the athlete. You cannot just think like, ah, oh, she should be able to run this pace because that's what she does in the training. No, it's just kind of like, you feel it out, right? And uh, and and we work pretty well uh, with that. We also, uh, you know, told Honza to it will be good to see him a few times on, uh, you know, in Livigno or alongside the trails in case we need something. We told him we probably will not need anything because I have everything, but just in case, you know, have it ready. And actually, we needed to change gloves, so I, again, having the phone, I could text him, hey, we will need gloves the next time when we see you. So he went to the car, get those gloves. He was waiting there. He actually didn't know exactly which gloves. So he had the whole bag there. I could pick it up and give you what, what you needed, mm -hmm. you know? So it was really, really good. Yeah. And then there were three aid stations on the course um, every three miles after seven miles. Um, they had limited stuff. They had pie. Um, <laughs> they had Coke, water, and a few other items. They didn't um, have water. They have aqua. Aqua. Yeah. So because when, when I got to the telling them water, water, and they were like, aqua, 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 aqua. <laughs> when I got to the aid station, I would just grab a few sips of water and then I would keep running or walking, whatever I needed to do. And then Corral would catch up. So he was kind of leapfrogging. He would go ahead and then he would catch up to me. So yeah, we tried I'm, to make, I take everything that we needed to do. I fill it up, uh, the Coke bottle. I fill it up, uh, your flasks and, uh, we had baggies with powder, yeah. uh, never second. So yeah, so we were just very dialed in, um, and it worked really well, but like with any long distance race, there's things that you have to take care of. And there was times that I wish I was able to run, but I had a side stitch or I just, you know, had low energy and I needed to get that back up. So we had to adjust. Um, so it's just, a lot of communication, trying to take care of things. And then eventually I get to a point where I am so tired. I am so sore that I really need Corral to make those decisions just because I, I can't, I'm just too tired. Um, and then as we got to T3, which is a cutoff point and also where you have to mandatory have support crew, we had kind of discussed prior to that, should we wear put on our trail shoes? Should we keep with what we're doing? We kind of had an idea of what the course was going to be like because we were running on a similar section. So we decided to keep the trail shoes no, or the keep, running keep, shoes Keep the road on. shoes because it was, uh, it was dry, you know. Was, the... Yeah, packed gravel, um, some grass. Then also Corel had planned to, we had to drop off our uh, backpacks um, the day before with required gear, pants, waterproof hooded jacket, gloves, a uh, hat, uh, undershirt. headlamp, undershirt. undershirt. So those were required. Corel carried my bag. Um, so I didn't have to carry anything. He carried the hiking poles and got them ready when we were ready to, to hike up the first part. Um, so Corel really took on the load. So I like the meal. I had a backpack on my belly. <laughs> I had a backpack on my back. I carried the 
the, the sticks and I carry your, your flask. Yeah. And he also had a hydration pack without hydration on the, right. on yeah, the so run. So, with the so he could it. carry everything. Um, so we were very strategic with, with that. And we learned from Canada man, that it was just too much for me to carry. Um, so yeah. And then the last, um, last few miles were just brutal. And I think that's where we really learned from Canada, man, that we have to, we have to move as fast as possible. And, and even we, if you're walking, it has to be very fast and meaningful. Yeah. And it's in the dark. We had our headlamps and you just see these little two headlamps of people. And we just made it a mission. Try to catch the next person, try to catch. Yeah. And my back was hurting me. My shoulders were hurting me. And even when we, when you were already at your limit trying to go, and move as fast i kept encouraging you just dig a little bit more yeah. just just yeah sometimes just i would just take like five steps around a switchback like fast steps and then start walking again but in these races it it really does come down to these little decisions that you're just making all day long um so yeah and then when we got to that finish line um I that was my greatest fear at that point was how do I get up this it was bonkers. finish it, it line? Was so steep and so loose. <laughs> I was like, well, I don't think I'm going to get up it. You just crawl it. Yeah. So, and then once we finished, I was exhausted and it was really special to finish that with Honza there, with Corel there. Uh, and then we took the chairlift back down into Lavinium. So that was the story, uh, the behind the scenes, as you can, as you may have heard, there's a lot of logistics uh you kind of grow into the sport i love the piece of just uh of the adventure aspect and not knowing and everything is different and you have to plan and be organized um so if that's something that excites you, you if this excites you you might want to look into extreme try i do think that the canada man is a great kind of step into it just because the swim and the bike aren't too extreme uh, relative to an Ironman, uh, only the run. So I think it's just a great way to kind of get your feet wet to see what it's all about. All right. If you have any questions, let me know. Take care.